Welcome, everyone. I feel like I'm in class trying to get the faculty to be quiet. <laughs> uh, welcome to the community lecture series. This is the fourth lecture of this year, and we're very, very honored to have Dr. Devindu Sandhu with us tonight to talk about jumping genes. A couple of uh, logistics first. The library actually closes at 8 o'clock, correct, Mark? And that means that normally, we'll try to stay in this room. That door might close. It doesn't mean you can't get out, but we prefer that you go out the Main Street side, which is that door right behind you. And if there's any kind of an emergency, that's the way you should go anyway. Um, normally, our lecture will run for about 45 minutes or so, and then we leave time for questions that our speaker will answer directly from the crowd. And usually about 8 o'clock or 8.05 or so, I will get up and I will ask, I will thank our speaker again, and then you can speak informally with our speaker. We need to be out of this building at about 8.30. All right. So having said all of that, I want to welcome you to the Community Lecture Series. Uh, the College of Letters and Science is really proud of this series. This is an opportunity for us to bring to the public plenty of students, plenty of faculty, plenty of people from UWSP, just what it is we do as faculty. And Devinder and I have gotten to know each other pretty well over the last two or three years. I'm also a scientist, although I'm not a geneticist, and most of what he's going to be talking about, even though I have a biology background, I will have no idea what those words are. So I ask you to be gentle with us, Devinder, <laughs> and define, define some of these terms I'll, as we I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> um, having said all of that, our next lecture will be on February 14th, and that will be Dr. Justin Reed out of the psychology department talking about the educational and psychological benefits of study abroad programs. We decided to do something a little different tonight, and I think we might do this continuing, depends on how it works out. And I'm looking over at Alex right now. Um, I was talking to some faculty, and, and Mark and I were talking about it, and I got to know a student by the name of uh, Alexandra Olhoff. And did I say that right, Olhoff? I'll What's that? Alexandria. Alexandria. Is that right? Yes. Good. Now that I've got that correct. Um, and we were, we were doing a tour with the Board of Regents through the old science building. I call it the old science building now because hopefully we'll have a new one very soon. Um, and the Board of Regents, we walked through Dr. Sandhu's lab. We took him on a tour. I, I told him, I said, why don't we bring him up through your lab and maybe get to some of the things you're doing. And we brought two Board of Regents members from the state. They came up and we entertained them for the eve for the morning, talked about some of the initiatives we have going. And we walked through uh, Dr. Sandhu's lab and we bumped into this student. And lo and behold, Board of Regents are not shy people. He walked right up to him and said, so where are you from and what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm from Merrill, Wisconsin. Well, guess where he's from? He was from Merrill, Wisconsin. So this was, and then the Board of Regents looks, glares over at me and, oh yeah, clearly this was a setup. You know, you found out where I was from and you stuck this student in here. That's not at all the case. In fact, uh, Alexandria is in fact from Merrill, Wisconsin. And it turned out to be a really interesting opportunity. She's also a member of my student advisory council. And I have students who represent every department. And she's, she's highly honored to be representative of the biggest department that we have on campus. We have almost 1,000 students in that department. And so what I decided to do was, why don't we have one of your students introduce you? Because everyone, everyone can listen to me. They get tired of hearing me honor all these people as being the greatest thing since sliced bread. So having said that, I want to introduce Alexandria. How about I just say Alex? Is that OK? Thank you. Alex is from Merrill. She graduated. Uh, she will be graduating from this institution this coming May, we hope. Uh, she has a major in biology and a minor in chemistry, and her research interest in plant genetics. Um, she has been involved in a variety of things on campus. I'm very proud of her. When we talk about some of her accomplishments, she formed a special scholar society at UWSP. It's a student organization for undergraduate research students. And I think, and you're the president, correct? And you're the founder, which is really something to, uh, to be proud of. Uh, she presented at our recent undergraduate uh, research symposium. Uh, in January, she'll present a paper at the International Plant and Animal Genome Conference in San Diego. She's been a collaborator in soybean genetic research with Dr. Sandhu now for a couple of years, and they've collaborated on research which was recently published in Functional and in in Integrative Genomics uh, after securing a, a grant from the United Soybean Council. 
Her personal interests are reading and adventuring and gardening. And I'm glad gardening is in there because that's appropriate. You will be a, a great gardener having a background in plant genetics. Having said that, I would like to introduce Alex Olhoff to who will introduce tonight's speaker. Mm -hmm. Alex? Join me in welcoming Dr. Vinder Sandhu. 
Um, hello, everybody. Can you hear me fine? So I would like to start with uh, thanking Chris and Alex for so nice introduction. <clears throat> and I would also like to thank everybody here to taking time to come to this presentation. <clears throat> so today, the title of my talk is Let's Play Tag with Jumping Genes. And I'm going to uh, explain everything about that in a minute. But I would like to start uh, with my research lab my focus of my research lab. So I work on two main systems. One is wheat, other one is soybean. In wheat, I'm running a big project right now um, that is to make wheat shorter. Wheat plant, as it matures, all the grains are present on the top part of the plant. So it is top heavy. If there is a little bit wind, the plant will lodge. That creates big problem in harvesting. Also, the seeds, they will start rotting. So what we want to do is we want to make wheat shorter so it is more tolerant to lodging. And I'm trying uh, a few new genes which can make uh, wheat shorter, but still wheat will be uh, producing higher yields. <clears throat> Then in soybean, there are several different projects going on in the lab. So one is on disease resistance, where we are trying to make soybean resistant uh, to several diseases. One is on oil quality, to make the oil more polyunsaturated, which is more healthy. And then there are two projects which uh, we are trying to understand the basic organization of the genome how the genes are present in uh, soybean genome. And today, I will be focusing on jumping genes, that how we can use the jumping genes to characterize soybean genes. So first of all, I'll start with definition of jumping genes. Jumping genes, which are commonly called as transposable elements, also transposons, that is the segment of DNA which will jump from one place in the genome to somewhere else. So this work was initially done by Barbara McClintock in 1950s. At that time when she proposed that, that DNA can jump from one place to other place uh, in the genome. So this word I'm going to be using many times, genome. Genome means it is all the genetic information present in one organism. So she said, DNA can easily jump from one place to other place in the genome. And people thought she's crazy. But later on, she got no Nobel Prize. <clears throat> she was studying corn. In corn, there is a gene called a C gene. That gene makes this pigment. So here you see some of the seeds, which are purple in color. So that is because of uh, that gene, C gene. If something goes wrong with that gene, the seed will become yellow. And then she showed that actually this change you see, that is because of a transposable element. So normally here in this picture, it is showing you C gene. If this gene is normal, then you see this purple color seed. In corn, this is the transposable element, which is called as ACDS. So there are two components to this transposome. This transposome can jump into the C gene. So when it jumps into that, it breaks the gene. It disrupts that. Then this gene becomes non-functional. So the purple pigment is no more there. So it becomes yellow. So then she showed that, that these transposable elements or jumping genes, they are not stable. They can jump out. If they can jump from one place to the other, they can also jump from that place to somewhere else. So this, if it jumps from here out of this color gene, color gene will revert back, and you will start seeing purple color spots in the grain. So that means where you see this purple color spot, that means gene jumped out of that place. Now it is reverting back to its normal color. Now we know a lot more about transposable elements. The transposable elements are very, very common. If you look at mammalian genomes, like humans, 
a 50% of the DNA is actually transposable elements. Corn, 80%. Barley, 85%. Soybean, 58% of DNA is actually transposable element. So when you, when you hear this, looks like these genes are kind of mass. These jumping genes will be jumping all over it and they'll break everything. That's not true. Most of these transposable elements are not active anymore. There are few which are active in corn. And before this study, there was none identified in soybean that was active. So the one we identified that is the first transposable element in soybean, which is still active. <clears throat> so very similar to uh, Barbara McClintock's work, in soybean, the purple color flower is controlled by a gene called as W4 gene. So this gene makes the pigment in flower. Flower will appear purple in color. But again, if something goes wrong with this gene, so it's represented by a small uh, W4, flower will become white. So if something is wrong with this gene. So then this is common to see purple color flower and white color flower, but we found one flower which showed variegated pattern. Variegated means it is white, but showing some spots. So it matched very much with Barbara McClintock's work where you start seeing some grains with purple color spots. And we named this as V4, uh, W4M. M means mutable. It is still active. So initially, it was simply one hypothesis that maybe there is a transposable element present in this, which is giving this pigmentation in the flower. But we had to prove that. <clears throat> so my two collaborators at Iowa State University, uh, Dr. Reed Palmer, and Dr. Madan Bhattacharya, and they worked on this project initially. They showed that W4 gene, which is flower color gene, that is making this purple color flower. And there is the transposable element present in this flower color gene, which is making it variegated. So once they identified that, they isolated this gene, which was making purple color flower. That was a big thing. And also, they found the sequence of this transposable element. So they got the whole DNA of this transposable element, that what is the sequence of this element. And that's how you can figure out how it's going to be uh, jumping in soybean. So after they identified that, and uh, we were talking about this project, we thought of this new project that if this transposable element is still active, we can utilize this transposable element and actually tag many genes in soybean genome. Because if it is going to jump, it should also jump out of this flower color gene. And when it is going somewhere else in the genome, it is going to break those genes. 